started, we really recommend you try a web browser system, you try a remote desktop system, you try uh, special software maybe from ICOM or Kenwood for your radio. But I think you'll find these old guys who've been doing remote a long time, they all start to migrate towards these front panels because the, the feel is so good, they just like it. But be careful if, if you try to jump into that right away because it can be expensive, it can be hard to set up. Um, we're just going to talk briefly about audio again. People think that compressing and transferring the audio across the network could cause a lot of problems. Um, it's really a very minor problem. Millions of people stream music all the time over the internet these days. They don't have any problems. We are less demanding than they are. So it is very rarely that you have any problem with your streaming audio. Uh, people who actually need the audio to be really good, like uh, RIDI contesters or people who operate in digital modes, PSK, JT65, they rarely find problems with the audio either, and they're very uh, concerned about the quality of the audio. So you usually don't have to worry about the audio quality at all. Here's what you do have to worry about. Everything else in the shack, other than the radio, other than the audio, how do I control the rotator? How do I control the amplifier? How do I control that antenna tuner? What about that little switch I always have to reach up to and change when I go to 40 meters, you know? I don't know how to do that remotely. You have to kind of figure out solutions for everything else in the shack. And that's probably 90% of the effort. The 10% is getting your radio control to work remotely. That's the easy part. Luckily, you can start in slowly. Maybe use a, an antenna that's good on multiple bands. Uh, maybe not use the amplifier first until you see everything's working good. Then figure out how to use the amplifier. Things like that. But um, I, I'm going to warn you now that it's exciting to get the radio control working. It's exciting to hear the audio. And then you start to realize, oh my gosh, now how do I turn this on and off? How do I control that? So be thinking about everything you want in your shack, not just the radio. Um, this is a little example of a rotator control program and a stepper antenna control program. Uh, it's called a PST Rotator AZ. It costs maybe, uh, I don't know, $50. It's not very much. But that can control every rotator I've ever heard of, and many I never didn't know existed. And it can also control your stepper antenna. You don't need the stepper control box remote with you. The software can control these things remotely. So there are solutions for a lot of these problems. Um, but it's going to take a little bit of investigation, a little bit of work, setting things up, trying to help. Um, as you operate remotely, what you'll find out are there are some killer problems when something actually needs the switch to be switched or the plug to be changed. And there's, you know, there's, I hate to tell you there's more of those than you can anticipate or believe exist. But eventually you get through with them one at a time, one at a time, and your station stays up longer and longer and longer, and the reliability keeps getting better and better. But keep in mind there's always going to be some little problem. So um, please don't set your remote station up on Heard Island and then leave because <laughs> eventually you need to actually show up at the station and change something. Um, you mentioned AC power and we'll cover that briefly. Um, a lot of people successfully just leave everything on and you can actually set PCs up to automatically reboot when the power comes back on. Um, a lot of uh, internet equipment like routers and modems and wireless access points, they all come back on when the power comes back on. But if you actually want to turn power on and off, there are these internet control power switches. You can get a simple one with one outlet for $40. You can get a complicated one with eight outlets for $130. You basically bring up a web browser and it shows you your, your power outlets and you turn on and off the ones you want to turn on and off. It's pretty easy. Um, you should be able to reboot your computer remotely if you can. You should be able to to figure out what's my internet address remotely. <coughs> um, you can use a, a dynamic name service to let you uh, track that internet address for you. Um, and a hint is it often helps to have a little <coughs> webcam sitting there pointing at your radio and computer so that when you're remote you can say, what is going on? You can look at the webcam like you were trying to check in on uh, the sleeping baby or something. Use your webcam and see what the heck is going on. Yes? The new version 7 of that uh, web power switch also monitors the equipment and if your 
PC or other devices and responding to pinging the request that can automatically reboot it. Yes, what he, what he said is the latest versions of these power switches actually monitor your equipment, and if the internet uh, ping return isn't there, it will automatically boot the equipment for you. That's because these were designed for people who were running computer server farms, and if the server ever got hung up, they wanted it to automatically reboot. So you can put that in place. I haven't activated that on mine because that's one more thing that could confuse me, and I don't need any more confusion. I'm going to skip some of these other areas because we want to get to our other speakers. My slides are at k6ufo.com if you want to learn about what we recommend for antenna switching. What do we recommend for rotator control? What do we recommend about tuners? What do we recommend about amplifiers? Uh, there's some extras. What if I need more serial ports at the remote site? Um, how is this audio delay, if there is any, going to affect me? I might need, if I want to use a paddle, I need to make sure that the delay isn't making my Morse code confusing when I try to use the paddle. So there's a lot of other issues. They can be solved. People have solved them. There are solutions. I hate to scare you with them too early in this process. Um, here's how easy a remote operating station can look. That's in my San Francisco condo. Uh, I have a little Elecraft front panel on the left. I have my laptop. I have some extra screen space. I have my little remote rig modem on the right, and I have a little uh, internet connection off to my cable modem, and I can connect up everywhere. It works great. If I'm actually traveling around, all I really need is my laptop and a mouse. Uh, most people like to have a few extras, like if they like CW, they might bring their own keyer and their own paddle, just because they like that feel. They don't want to try to send CW from the laptop uh, all the time. And uh, uh, OZ4 UN had a great idea. He says, well, bring your phone or bring your tablet, too, because while the computer's busy running the things up on your tablet, so you know the guy's name when you talk to him, and maybe you want to keep your logbook separately from the radio control. But it's that easy. You don't have to bring very much with you. Um, I'm not going to go through these examples of how you connect up to a station, because it's really easy. There's basically four or five steps, tops. Uh, I, if you track me down, I can show you how to do it from my phone. I can do it in under a minute. So once it's all set up, using your station is pretty easy. Um, in closing, I want to make sure I emphasize, there's no single correct way to do it. You have different interests. There might be a different way you want to do it. Some use more software. Some use more hardware. Um, some work better with laptops or smartphones and tablets, and others don't. Uh, maybe you actually have multiple radios at your shack you want to control. That kind of adds a little more complexity. Some of these solutions can do multiple radios easily. Some of them are kind of stuck with only one radio per one hardware box, for instance. Um, this is still ham radio experimentation. You can try some things out, see what works, have a lot of fun. Uh, everything's going to change by next year, so please come back and tell us uh, what we were wrong about and what you found out and what you have found worked better. And um, in closing, I just want to say the reason we do remote operating is because we want to be on the air and have fun. Um, it, it, it lets you be on the air from any place, any time. Any time you have that little itch to operate, I can get on the air. And uh, let me close with something Fred, uh, old-timer Fred said. He was worried that operating remote was uh, not going to be as much fun as when he could make his RF at home. But it turned out it was not that case. He had a lot of fun. He's on the air all the time remotely to a station in Nevada. He has a great time. So, uh, Brian, come on up, and we'll let you do the second part here. And while Brian gets his up, I maybe have time for one or two questions. Yeah, in the back there. What is, what is the best knowledge source, data source, besides your website? To, to, to okay, so there are a lot of people who set up remote stations uh, and a lot of people publish everything about what they're doing, like uh, AB1OC and AB1J. Uh, there is an ARL book about remote operating. There's uh, websites and YouTube videos. So I, I hate to tell you to go to Google, but that is, that's the way to get the most current information about what people are doing and what works. And, and particularly the issues with our IT partners, with our mm -hmm. Oh, now that's good because if you're having a an, an problem with uh, IP addresses or your router, 
There are millions of techie guys out there who have solved that problem, and they have all kinds of web pages telling you how to find out your IP address, how to restart the router, how to open the port so your data gets through. So technical problems like that, the Internet is a goldmine of answers for those technical problems. But yeah? Still all in court. There is not all the information in one place. No, nope, not yet. Maybe in 10 years, but not now. Yeah, right there behind. Do you have any car stories where uh, something ran wild or really? Horror stories. You know, actually, I don't have any horror stories when things went wild. I have disappointing stories where I wanted to, like, operate a contest, and it just wouldn't turn on for some reason. And I couldn't figure it out till the next time I went to the station and saw what was wrong. So, but no horror stories. I do have a few disappointment stories. <laughs> Brian, please. Tell, yeah. us, tell us about some real stations, Brian. Oh, real stations. Thanks, Mark. Don't forget to count everyone. So, I'm a... Uh, I'm Brian Moran, N980G. And I thought I'd tell you about a couple of stations that I know about. But you know, the, the real mo the in most interesting way to find the stations that you want to find out about is go look at like 3830 scores at the end of a contest. And people write up what they do. And I'll, you'll see more and more people at the end of the contest are saying, oh, yeah, I was operating remote from my northern New York station. And I was sitting in Manhattan, you know, because I had to do something else. But I put in so many hours, and this is the great score I got. So uh, you'll find that there are more and more people that are doing this for contesting, for casual rag chewing, for chasing DX. Um, and uh, I think it's just going to start to get more boring as we um, ac accept that um, people are using remotes. Um, I found out about Frank, VO1HP, who is using his remote station um, pretty much right on an ocean shore to do 160 meter contacts. And he uses low power um, with his 160 meter <laughs> um, setup and does really quite well. And um, as Mark pointed out, he's using a um, solution that affords him the ability to have a, 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 have a control panel. He's using remote rig and a K3. Pretty simple setup. He's out there kind of in the boonies, doesn't have too um, fast of an internet connection, but it's consistent. And um, he uh, remotes it for, with low power and has had nothing but fun with that. You can see him entering contests. You can see his description and write-ups. You can see actual nice pictures of his setup on qrz.com. Um, and uh, uh, he's uh, um, having, a, having a lot of fun with that. As far as someone who's doing, or a group of people who are doing something a little bit more complicated, the Snake River Contest Club, or Snake River Remote Contesters Club, which is at um, Joe Rudy, NK7U station in Eastern Oregon, they're doing some pretty complicated stuff. They have uh, the ability to have two radios on the air, and I think they're looking to do um, multi, so they, have more, they can get more radios on the air. And if you take a look, they have a lot of gear sitting on those racks. They have a bunch of rotator controllers. Those are the Green Heron ones, and they are connectable via serial or USB. They have a number of servers. There's some power controllers. Um, looks to be a couple PCs running it all. And so the reason why they did this is uh, Eastern Oregon is pretty far away from a lot of places, <laughs> um, everything else practically. So um, when they were trying to gather enough people to come and do remotes out there, it was difficult. So this, um, by d doing a, um, sorry, doing contest operations, it was difficult to get everyone to show up. By doing remote, they actually increased participation because people could continue their lives and get together for their uh, remote um, operation, but then um, uh, not have to bu uh, budget in six to 12 hours in aggregate of travel to get there. Um, and what they um, started to do is um, dipping their toe in using some of the combination of remote desktop and software controlled solutions. But you'll see um, what they've ended up doing as far as a block diagram. Um, <laughs> they're using remote rig and a lot of control um, to control the rotators, control the antenna switches, control the bandpass filters. 
Now, it looks pretty complicated, but I don't know about you, I've set up, um, say, for field day or for a multi-single or for a multi-two, you will, by nature, have multiple rigs, you have bandpass filters, you have lockouts, maybe, you have two-by-six antenna switches, you, you, well, you better have lockouts, otherwise you're going to you're gonna be blowing something up. You're going to have um, uh, rotator controls, you've got... Uh, you need the ability to chat with the other operators. All the stuff that you would normally have, now you just have to hook it all up to computers and make it so that you can use it from other places. So that's what they've done. They have a couple of K3s, they have remote rigs, and plus they've got all of the, what I call the topology problem. They have to control the way the stuff is hooked together and the way the routing of the signals go. Um, again, in, in this instance, one station or another station can use the same antenna, just separated by time, so they have things like two by six antenna switches and, and bandpass filters that actually have to be switched. It's quite the complicated setup, and um, they've done a lot of things to automate it. Now, um, one of the things that I think, if you've ever run a multi-two or done a uh, something like that, the more you automate it and take the decisions out of it, the fewer mistakes one might make in the middle of the night when you're tired and switching things. So there are some benefits of, of actually taking the time and hooking it up so that when you switch to 20 meters, that you're really on 20 meters and everything falls in line. You don't have to like switch the amp, switch, uh, turn the uh, antenna switch, make sure the other station's not on the same um, switch, uh, uh, put in the right filters in line. Again, automating all that, um, which you're going to have to do to get it remoted, um, also helps when you're not using it in the remote sense. Now, they've gone further. The, this is the setup that the um, Snake River contesters are using to dip their toe into the SO2R um, control of that station. So what they've got to, this is what you would have at your house where you don't have all the radios. Um, what they have is a K3 Mini running on the front end to do the frequency control and the other radio controlled via a virtual K3 represented by the win for, um, uh, a win for K3 suite. Um, and this is all, again, going over the internet and controlling all of that other gear in that other in slide. So the, comp the, the complications are coming in for SO2R on both ends, both on this, the side that is remote, but also you have to consider some of the thing, consider some of the issues behind SO2R on your wherever you're controlling this from. So that's a really complicated um, situation. And those guys are doing some pretty darn interesting things, and I think they're they're um, getting to be on the cutting edge. Uh, I would invite you to go take a look at K9CT's control point that he has here for his station as part of the um, Experience HF project. I think you're going to talk about this. Great, I won't say anything more, but you should go take a look at it. So, so that was a really complicated thing. Now let's go to look at the really, really simple thing. Um, last, uh, a few mo couple months ago, uh, the VP8 was on, and I didn't have an effective station at home um, to contact the VP8. But I go down to a friend of um, mine, K7BTW, in about uh, 80 miles away, and we go and operate uh, multis uh, from um, his location. So we have a you know multi multi one multi two kind of setup, and, and we have a six by two antenna switch. We have you know the main main antenna, which is a DB18, uh, a secondary antenna, which happens to be a two element stepper. We've got a couple of 160 meter, a one and one sixty meter antenna, and eighty meter antenna. We use it for mostly for RIDI contests. I wanted to get on and work the VP8. My single vertical in the backyard with 100 watts wasn't cutting it. So I said, I said hey, um, let me walk you through setting up something at your house. So we installed in about 10 minutes TeamViewer, and I installed Skype. And this enabled me to use the second operator position already installed on, uh, in, in his house on the, in the radio station to remote it and allowed me to work the VP8 um, remotely. So I had him be my remote hands for a second and I bootstrapped my way onto being able to control it by having him install TeamViewer first. Then I set up Skype to automatically answer when I called in with Skype on my end. 
I had him turn the, the uh, rotator to, uh, of the antenna manually in the direction I wanted it to and um, make sure that on the 6x2 antenna switch, which does not yet have a computer interface, to make sure I wasn't on the same band or, uh, um, as the other radio. And I worked BP8 and took me you know, about 40 minutes, but um, I sat through the pileups with 100 watts and, and did it. So, was he in the shack at the same time as his shack? Um, he was in the shack, but he wasn't using them. He worked them a number of days before. So, um, but he uh, made sure that I wasn't going to be blowing up the other K3's front end. You know, we had the, you know, you know, the, the front end filters in, and we also made sure we weren't on the same band. And he had to answer your Skype call right in there. He did not. Oh. Skype, if you, the question was, did he have to answer my Skype call? Um, the answer is no. Skype's got an automatic answer facility um, in it. So you can set it so that anyone time, someone tries to connect, it automatically connects. Um, and what's funny is there are people that spam call you on, sp on Skype if you have a public thing. They get an earful of static when they call my <laughs> Skype thing, so uh, most of the time. So, uh, that's, uh, thanks. Mitch points out that it, it is possible to restrict Skype to certain users. I don't bother doing that. I think that, you know, that's a feature, not a benefit, to give an unintended <laughs> caller some static. The team viewer also has um, I don't use that facility. I always seem to, to use Skype, so um, I don't use the audio. Oh, sorry, <coughs> team viewer automatic answer facility. Um, team viewer you set up certain um, designated users, and it will only allow um, authorized users to access your, um, the desktop. So no one had to be there? No one had to be there. Yes, sir? Does Team Viewer 11 uh, take the place of Skype? I am a creature of habit in some things, so I, this is 10 minutes. I was like, okay, I got to slam it on there, do something that I know that works. I so I, I haven't. Great. So the comment was that Team Viewer, I can eliminate the Skype component by just using the Team Viewer. Version 11. Version 11. Okay. I was running Team Viewer host on uh, that particular thing. Uh, so where I want to go in the well, the, the pros it was ten, there was no file there were no firewall issues because I used um, Team Viewer to connect in the middle. For the use that I was using it for, Team Viewer is free. They allow um, uh, free use for personal and non-commercial. Thank you, Team Viewer. Um, and the cons were that you know I can only really use it for CW. I set up some macros really quickly um, to um, um, do this, and uh, you can drive with N1MM. It was already set up to run with N1MM to um, for contesting. So you put it on DX and use macros and N1MM to send. Um, and I had to have um, K7BTW turn the antenna in the right direction since I didn't have rotator control and um, give me the right uh, band because we didn't have, he was a stepper, I didn't have stepper control at that point. So once, you know, it boils down to, in this instance, again, um, the fact that there's, there are control issues, not just the radio, that you have to deal with. The, ro the rotator, your antennas, your band pass filters, everything um, like that. So where do I think this stuff's going in the future? Um, I think you're already seeing this, that all the, the, the pieces are starting to grow computer interfaces. Now, whether it's a computer interface that has a network plug right in there or a USB serial model, whichever, just that it's no longer confined to just the knobs. Um, the 6x2 antenna switch that I happen to be using today um, only has knobs, so that's a, a great candidate for either getting swapped out or building an interface circuit to it. Um, you know, and, and in the future, you, you would think that as people are adding the control aspect into their equipment, maybe they'll take the time to not only do it with wires, but also go wireless. The Maestro guys with the, the Wi-Fi uh, connectivity, it seems like a positive direction. <clears throat> I think that what you'll also see over time is um, the remote capability isn't going to be something special or what have you. Um, the Maestro folks and Flex Radio aren't selling this as a remote feature. They're selling it as a convenience feature. You can walk around the house, you can go sit down, you can go to a different room and bring that console with you. I think that little, that little way of thinking about it, that paradigm shift is an important one because all of a sudden we're just going to say, oh yeah, I can control that. And it's just going to have to have that capability. It'd be a little checklist uh, item. Um, it costs about six bucks for the part to, you know, for a wireless uh, network interface now. Um, so there's no, really no reason not to put them in. And um, G 
just as in today that we have certain challenges if you have any kind of complicated AV setup at home, like your cable box, talking to your DVR, talking to your HDTV, talking to your home theater, um, if, or if you call it that anymore, um, talking to maybe a computer that's hooked up, talking to your Xbox, you know, you pick up the remote control and it's like, well, what do I do again to get this all set up right? You know, it's been since the 90s that we've been working on it from the consumer aspect for um, uh, audio and video. I think those challenges will likely con continue because we've got some really non-standard stuff and the way it hooks up is unique to every single person sitting here in the audience. So those, those will be probably the topology issues that will continue to plague us. Um, and I think what's going to really be interesting is once we can assume that you have remote control capability built into the different pieces, what are some other really cool things that are going to happen? You, today, and Mark points out that for, say, um, the gamers um, that are using computers to do things, um, they, we borrow technology for, for audio and for some networking things when we build some of our solutions. Well, some of the other things that they're doing are, if you've got a friend that's in a game and they're walking behind you, you can hear them in your headphones as they are walking behind you. The games already have in the capability to move sound sources in the audio field. Imagine if we could do something like that for different um, antennas that we have hooked up with different receivers, plumbing the audio into different parts in our sound field. It's like, diverse, it's like virtual diversity. If you ever use diversity with, say, a K3 with multiple receivers, say, on 160 meters, wow, it's crazy good. You can hear, like, Europeans are always in this direction, and, you know, North America is always over here. So there will be some pretty interesting applications there. Um, I also think that, um, say, for example, the new feature in N1MM where you can use two keyboards to, um, on a single N1MM session so you can um, kind of buddy up on a band. You'll be able to do that, but from remotely, or maybe you'll have three or four people all be able to work on logging a band at the same time or working through uh, a number of uh, uh, contacts or a pileup in the same time. I think it'll enable the way we use our equipment to uh, change and, and maybe be more fun. Um, with that, um, Dennis, why don't you come up? Thank you. And I'll, if you have any questions afterwards, I'll take them. Do you want me to get to bring up? Well, good morning, everyone, again. I am standing up. Okay. Good morning. This year, last year, I became part of the uh, New England group that puts on the Boxborough Convention. And they said, why don't you do the remote station, or not the remote, special event station? So I said, fine. Then I started thinking around and said, well, what do we typically have for a special event station? Typical special event, you see the big radio, runs 100, maybe 200 watts. You, sometimes you get a manufacturer who will give you the new radio, their latest and greatest, so you can show it off. And outside you'll have a, a dipole at 20 feet, uh, maybe a hex beam at 30 feet. You're rather limited. Forget about a linear. There's no 220. And to try and operate a linear at a convention, boy, are you asking for trouble. Here's the antenna. This is a hex beam. I think this is from our 2007. I actually got these pictures. Antennas were always a compromise. If you put up a three-element antenna, that was a big antenna. Doublets, in our particular location, we were next to the electrical room. Very noisy. And we were sandwiched between the flea market and the vendors. Great location in the convention, but for RF, uh, not so hot. As I say, the linear was, a, no question, linear was out of the possibility. In good years, when we had great propagation, we could do 1,500 QSOs with that. In bad years, like the last two, we could do maybe 700 QSOs, five to 600 was more. When you're trying to interest new people 
in HF radio and you sit them down in front of the radio and they call CQ and no one comes back and they call CQ and no one comes back. After six to ten CQs, they get up, walk away, and you never see them again. Working DX is also fun, and it's difficult with 100 watts and an antenna at 30 feet. You can't count on 10 or 15 meters to open, not in August when the convention was. So last year I said, I'm experienced remote stations. Let's get four remote stations set up. We had access to admittedly big stations with linears, K1TTT, W1KM, K2LE, VY1AAA, VE4EA, and SE0X. Uh, those of you that aren't contesters, these, these are all big contest stations. And that we could get different propagation experience by the operators. And we got lots of answers. The fun quotient at a relatively flat propagation time went way up. Here you see this, the layout on the screen. This is from the K1TTT station. You can see the linear, uh, that particular uh, virtual linear front plate is for an ACOM 2000, which is an automatic band switching antenna, uh, amplifier. Uh, that's Marty KC1CWF, yakking away on sideband, running Europeans. N1MM. Well, I mean, if, I mean, what are the four methods? Was it web interface, or uh, it's, it's a combination. They use Skype for the audio, TeamViewer to connect the two. And here you can see the front panel on the computer. There's another shot of it. Uh, many of the remote guys that I run with are all into using N1MM as the logging program of choice, although there's no reason why you couldn't use write log or win test. There's nothing special about it. You could use your favorite logging program. Here's another guy sitting there working. And overall, people loved it. They could get on the air. They could get answers. As you can see, the final result, we made about 1,300 contacts on 20 meters, 1,837 contacts total, worked all continents in 76 counties, countries. And this was from a station that we set up. Another big thing, it took us two hours to set all the remote stations up. How long would it have taken us to set up the antenna and the latest, greatest transceiver, run the cables, and then of course you've got to pull the cables out at night. Uh, we had no FRI, no RFI issues with anyone because we weren't generating any RFI or any RF. We were able to overcome terrible propagation and the only issue we came up with is internet bandwidth. We found pretty much we could only operate three on the bandwidth that we had. So that we just didn't use the fourth station. But it turned out to be a very positive experience, a lot of fun. Uh, and everything was straight, went really straightforward. If you're getting involved in a special event station and you can do it, take a look at using a remote station. It's a lot of fun and it'll increase the amount of fun for the operators. Any questions? Yeah. My call, sorry about that, W1UE, although if I'm in a contest, there may be any one of a dozen other calls. And what's the other call, the question? Yeah. Is there a simple procedure? It basically, it's free. You download it. And of course, you need to have a buddy that has it that's going to let you connect. I've already connected it. Okay. 
Yeah, you, he just has to give you permission to do it. Uh, remote is also, by using remote rigs, I've been able to take remote to people that are shut in, uh, convalescent, hospital, uh, assisted living. We took it to one gentleman that was a, a well-known CW op in his day. And he didn't make any contacts, but just to put the headphones on and to hear the CW again. Gentleman was 96 years old, and, and his daughter called me up afterwards and said he talked about that for weeks after the fact. He just enjoyed it. And without a remote-type operation, we wouldn't have been able to do that. Yeah? Dennis, did, did you do all that setup yourself, or did you have an IT person? That's the first question. And the second question is, would you call this the remote desktop approach? I mean, were you using the remote desktop method to get into these patients? Okay. This was all set up by hams, no IT people. I mean, did you do it all yourself, or were there different people? That you I could have done it all myself. It just would have taken longer. I think we had three or four people do un involved in the setup. Each guy set up one remote station. And easily within two hours, we'd resolved any issues that we had, and we were on the air with all four stations. And it took more bandwidth to search it with remote desktop. I can't tell you why. Uh, it's just that when we took one of the stations off, uh, everybody else's performance improved. And we had two setups that were remote rig based and one setup that was remote desktop. Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to tell us about experiencing HF at the ARL Expo? Yes. At Discover the HF experience, the ARRL booth. We have currently four remote stations set up there. Uh, I think we have one that's remote desktop, two that are remote rig based, and one that's using a Flex Maestro. And it's the Flex Maestro was manned by somebody from Flex because none of us have ever used that system before. So I honestly don't know how to use it, and I don't want to have somebody there that's new to HF when I don't know how to use a radio myself. Not a good show. So he's there. Yeah, I encourage anybody that wants to see it, come on by. And yeah, we have a number of people that have already signed up to use it, but be happy to show it to you. You look over the shoulder, see us operate, and see how smooth it is. Uh, I was amazed, actually, when I got into it. The only time I know I'm on a remote station is if I'm using CW with a 500 hertz bandwidth and I tune the radio, all of a sudden I'll hear a bloop. Yep. I just missed the station, tune it back just a little bit, and there's the station on CW. Other than that, it's almost seamless. I'm a contester, 150, 160 hour on CW, easy to do on remote rig. Anything, any other questions? Uh, I believe he covered that before. Uh, dial up and what was the other one? Uh, satellite. satellite were no good. Most of the others with a decent connection can be used. Uh, DSL, that kind of thing can be used. Uh, it depends a lot on your particular situation and your particular provider. Mitch wants to say something. Yeah, I, can, I can probably answer all that. I've set up dozens of those things. Um, basically, what you've got to look at your internet connection. It, it, remember, the, uh, most of the connections are asynchronous. You get less up going up and down. However, all this remote stuff is synchronous. You need as much bandwidth going in as coming in. So be careful with that. So always, always look at your uplink. You can say, i got 10 megabits, but you may only have 500 paid up. So you got to be careful what you got there. Then you can optimize it.
performance running the lines for about 300 pages, going up or down. Uh, on, on, so you should have about three, 400 minimum, but if you've got 200, 256 K going up uh, or down, you should be able to uh, get a remote grid operation working quite well. Okay, which is actually less than if you can use for TV or not. Ah, okay, we'll have con con questions in a few minutes. The last short presentation is on BY1 AAA. Uh, many of you have heard of the call. He's in White House Yukon, and by the way, he's another contester. Uh, a lot of this seems to be being driven by contesters right now. I don't know if it's because we're more vocal or we want to maximize the fun, but that's kind of where we're coming from with, with the talk. <coughs> We had a successful GoFundMe campaign and raised over four grand to assist him in putting up some bigger antennas and a remote station in the off in here. Uh, he's got a 70 foot tower that's rebuilt and there's a beam that's gonna be going on it soon. Uh, winter comes quickly to Whitehorse and shipping to there it really is a pain. Uh, the station owner is now 70, J, V, Y, 1, J, A. And though the mind is willing, the body can't do what it needs to do. And we're still working on logistics and learning them on a station that that's remote. Uh, Jerry, W1VE, managed to find somebody nearby that would climb the tower and do the work. And we also found a better way to ship goods up there to Whitehorse through Cary VE4EA. Right now, we still have omnidirectional antennas. Quarter wave ground plane on 80 and 40, and there'll be some V beans coming up soon. And we're still looking for a decent tri bander. Uh, there's an Alpha 7 9500 there that's still giving problems. One thing about a remote station if you have RFI problems when you're operating it locally, when you're down at the station operating it, or you can't use FSK, or you're having feedback in your audio lines, none of that's going to go away if you remote things. So one of the first things you want to do is whatever you're going to remote to is to make sure the stuff there works. Remoting it won't fix things because you're still generating the RF there. Contest operations so far, uh, and that's really the time we've spent there, is, is, is we've operated in the sprints, SSCW and phone, ARRLDX. Our goal is to make the multiplier available for at least 100 cues in every contest where it's a multiplier. So for the contesters, feel free to turn your antenna north, try and work us, and listen hard because 100 watts under the auroral borealis won't always get through very well. Anything? Anything else? Yeah. Uh, do you have a recommendation for virtual console software? Virtual comport software. Brian, you know about that. So there's this thing called Com Zero Com. Have you looked at that? Yeah. Um, it's a free, kind of like free solution. It's a free solution that, um, and it's, well, don't put it on the internet. It's not secure. But if you have a VPN or whatever, you want to you know, use a virtual uh, port, COM0, COM will do it, and in combination with COM to TCP. Now, you can buy commercial solutions from Lansonic and some other people, but they are expensive. So check that out first. COM0, COM, and COM2, COM, the number two, TCP. That might be whatever you want to run it. This will be over here. Uh, so if you want to run uh, a, a serial port over the internet, yeah. the remote rig boxes provide you with one to start with, an extra one. So you ran out of you ran out of serial ports. These uh, Landtronics serial port servers are kind of a little hardware box. It's designed to take serial ports and put them over the internet. 
Now they do cost, I don't know, $200 or something. Yeah, but they take, you know, you can buy one with four serial ports and it'll take it right over the internet for you. Landtronics is a good one. I, I'm going to recommend a different box that I've had good luck with, the Edge port. They have, you can get them on the internet. They're four and eight port boxes. They one USB serial. Uh, they are USB. You have to plug it into a computer to use them. Oh, you, you wanted an IP addressable one. You, okay. Um, yeah. Come on up here too, Brian, so we can answer some questions. I, I want to thank my speakers, and we're going to have some time now. <laughs> uh, we're going to have some time now for Q&A. Uh, please see our slides if you want, because there's a lot more solutions in there. Uh, you remember that, that complicated uh, Snake River remote contester uh, station he showed you? There's an article about it in the NCJ magazine. I have an extra one, so if someone is really interested in that wonderful contest station, please see me and you can see the article, and that's a free extra issue. And Q&A. Ted is excited about yeah, this. Yeah, I'm very excited because I really want to do remote, and this is the first time I've seen it. So thank you all so much. Um, yeah, yeah, let's see that again. <laughs> this is really great because, as you said, there's not one go-to site. It's fascinating because really has kind of evolved to where there are a few go-to sites, and this is going to be big remote. A question for you and also for Mitch. Do you, um, and anyone, do you integrate, like you said, a webcam is really important more to kind of see what's happening. Are any of you who are doing remote integrating like video around your house and your shack with your remote strategy? I imagine if you have a house in Germany and you're in Florida, how do you do that? I mean, is it like, do you get Nest and just make that a separate thing? Or do you integrate it in with your your shack remote so you, you can see what's happening. You can actually, you can use a, a security system or webcams over the internet just like anyone would buy them from Nest or buy them from somewhere on Amazon. It's not really connected to the radio equipment other than one of my cameras is pointed at the radio equipment. So it's a totally separate thing. Right? We just open a browser window okay. right, yeah. and show it. Yeah. yeah. Besides the 12, 16 boxes, you can use a serial port, so anything that has a serial port, you can use a remote serial port. Uh, this uh, PST rotator AZ can run any kind of crazy rotator or stepper or lots of other things. If you talk to Green Heron, they are very interested in being able to have people use their boxes over the internet. So Green Heron Engineering is is very helpful at making rotators and switch boxes and four square controllers and all kinds of stuff available. So Green Heron Engineering is a good place to talk to. They don't always make it clear on their website how to use it remotely, but if you send them an email or talk to them, they'll say, oh, you do this, you do this, and now it's remote. You know, so there are people if, working on this. If you're, if you're trying to control a rotor, a, if you have a rotor box, say a HAM4, that does not have a computer interface, I can recommend the ERC computer interfaces from Germany. They both have both USB and COM port uh, things. And you wire them in there, and uh, it's pretty much like you were just sitting at home turning the rotor. Uh, what, what do you do for lightning protection? What do you do now for lightning protection? Well, I'm there, and I know the storm's there. Right. I can turn it off. When you're not there, you don't know the storm's there. Okay, if you use uh, turn it off so uh, mo uh, many antenna switches, will automatically ground everything when there's no power applied. You have to know the storm's there to do that. Oh, uh, no, if you turn the antenna switch off, everything's grounded. No, you're operating. On okay, the storm. so so uh, so oh. I so I have this because uh, when I'm not operating, everything is automatically grounded. Right. Um, when I'm there, I'm usually in that little web browser window, and I don't know if you noticed, up in the little right-hand corner, they actually showed the weather at the station I was using. <laughs> you can watch, uh, you know, Weather Underground or the Weather Channel or whatever you want to watch. If, if we're concerned with it, we just shut it off. Well, yeah. For uh, mobile phone modes, like Olivia and things like that, if you're going to do the actual translation at the remote station, can you get away with, like, audio codecs, like, 
Um, so the question is, if you want to do digital mode, should you decode it at the station and then send the text, or should you bring the audio over and decode it where you are? Both work. Usually it's easier to set it up so you're doing the decoding where you are, where you have a computer and everything. We're going to talk about this at the RIDI contesting forum tomorrow at 10.15, uh, but none of the audio modes actually have enough of a demand for this to be a problem, except maybe JT65, the WSJT modes. And in that case, if you found, find you can't get decodes down far enough into the noise, you either improve your audio uh, codec streaming quality, or if you are really particular, then you go and do the decoding at the station and only send a text window back. But it's very rare that comes up, and usually bringing you the audio works fine. Yeah, right up here. Yes, sir. Uh, you guys didn't touch on the uh, three-minute timeout. The three-minute timeout. Well, that's because all the equipment I use has it built in automatically. There's a, a menu option. It already, it's already on. I don't even have to mess with it. I didn't have to put a special timer in, in other words. It's already built into the equipment. Yeah, back there. I'd like to understand the gentleman, the, the, the German U.S. gentleman. Ah, Mitch. Oh, Mitch is in trouble. They got his number. <laughs> I'd, like to, I'd like to understand your answer to the level of remoting we can do if we're limited to DSL. Can we get away with it? Oh, yeah. Sure. No problem. No problem. No problem. I, I used a DS line for, DSL line for over a year. And then eventually I said, oh, I want to do more. I want to have two stations. I want to have two radios. And then I upgraded. But a DSL line will work just fine. Well, well, I'm stuck with it. There's nothing I can do. Just make sure you get, you get at least 256K going out. You're okay. All right? If you're low, less than about 200K, you're going to have a... I got about 500 going up. Okay. That's fine. No problem. In the uh, purple shirt there, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Remote pan adapters. I'm going to talk to my futurist over here. Um, remote pan adapters. Uh, how, how does that work? Um, the answer is yes. In fact, there's a station, I think there's one in Germany that's remoting their uh, pan adapters. I, I can get you a link. At the Contest University yesterday, um, there was, hey, try this over the internet, and they have one. Um, I, the, Flex. Also, Flex. Flex. Flex will do it. Uh, they do it Wow, okay, so Mitch points out that in a Rube Goldberg-like way, <laughs> you can put a VGA capture card in your computer and capture the video, transport it, and then show it again from so, the P3. So, so, so the answer is yes, you can do a pan adapter, but it's really changing and evolving rapidly right now, but it's going to become common in, in one or two more years. Yeah. What's the simple... Sweet. That's why I point my webcam, uh, my webcam at the radio, because it can see the pan adapter too. I, I point my webcam at the linear, <laughs> so I can see the face on the linear. <laughs> well, it's spherical, so you can swing it over. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, so someone was brave enough to say, "I didn't understand." You know, that is absolutely okay. I have run into probably 50% of the stuff I run into in this business. At first, I don't understand it. And I just have to do a little research and say, oh, that's what's that about. And luckily, at least half the time, I learn. And I didn't really even need to learn that. I didn't need to know that. You don't want to know that. <laughs> you want to forget that. It's so I, I agree there are a lot of complicated technical parts and acronyms and and luckily, there's a lot of um, IT people who can help you with the, the technical things. There's a lot of hams who can help you with the station things. There's vendors who actually support their products very well. I've, I've been impressed with how much the various vendors want to help you make your station a success. But this isn't uh, buy it today and beyond tonight, although he gave us an example. It's, it, it takes a little bit of, of uh, trial and error, figuring out what's not working, how do I fix it, and over time it gets a lot easier and a lot better. I learned more about networking 
and computer protocols and port opening and closing on three or four different routers than I ever wanted to learn. Yeah. So he's asking about how does this affect a VHF, UHF, and Echolink, and wires, and uh, D-Star, and System Fusion. A, a lot of those systems already have a remote component already built in. It was really HF radio that didn't have any remote capabilities, so in a sense we're just kind of catching up with the rest of the, of the digital world here. But I, I think, like Brian said, you're going to see it become more and more common, convenient, just automatically built in, and it, it, you'll be able to operate your HF radio, your VHF radio, it won't make a big difference. Pick somebody in. Oh. Dennis. Yeah, I'm trying to get away from the computer and the remote. And I was wondering if anybody's found a relay board that IP addressable. There are uh, relay boards that are IP addressable. There's a lot of them. Some are more kind of kit format. Some are completely finished and ready to put in your factory for automation. Um, you can find them on the internet. The problem is they kind of expect you to already be a uh, an automation specialist to use most of them. No. Check remoteqth.com. Those guys have interesting Arduino-based everything. So if you want to build your own rotator controller, hey, you can find stuff there. Um, an IP-based relay board, they have that there. So, yeah. Remoteqth.com. Yes, again. And just a comment, he's on trying to show that I learned. The answer to the HF, VHF is the K3. Um, yeah, so some radios like the K3 can operate HF and VHF, and that's, and that's very convenient because you don't have to have all the equipment to switch to different radios when you want to operate differently. But some people prefer to have different VHF, HF radios. And you don't want to, for instance, buy two remote rig boxes, one for each radio, although that certainly would work. So usually what happens is you go to more like the remote desktop approach, where one computer can control more than one radio, and you just talk to that computer. So there are ways to do multiple radios, uh, multiple antennas, multiple amplifiers. Um, it, I just wouldn't jump into that as my first step, uh, you know, but you can get there. You know, we should also give credit where credit is due. You know, if you think about it, you know, Ryan, you know, long ago um, had a built-in network jack. You know, you plug your radio right into the network. TS-2000, you could get it headless. Um, you know, the 480s, TS-480s that we're using nowadays, um, they've been um, great for as components because they come with little remote heads. So, um, you know, it just seems that people have... It's achieved critical mass and accelerating in the last couple of years um, with everyone else. But, you know, those folks have been doing it for quite a while. All right, more questions. We have a little more time. Someone be brave. What, what do you not want to ask but you're going to ask anyway? There's one. Um, so, uh, the contest rules are always provided by the contest sponsor, and they'll always tell you what's allowed or what not allowed if the if the all the equipment has to be in one site, which is almost always the rule. Well, you're not supposed to use remote receivers, except in contests that allow them, like the uh, CQ, CQ Worldwide 160 meter contest lets you use a remote receiver. Stu Perry remote top end, uh, Stu Perry top end distance challenge. So, um, so again, it's like, well, whatever that contest says, maybe you can use a remote receiver. Uh, most of them don't allow any equipment away from the one site just to kind of keep the competition even between the site, you know, my, stations. My understanding is that several of the disqualifications, CQ Worldwide CW last year, were for people using remote stations. 
Um, so I should I should point out, like Sorry. he said, there are some disqualifications. Yeah, well, they weren't remote stations. They were un. They were remote station use that didn't fall within the rules. There's nothing that says you can't use a single remote station to enter that contest, but you can't have like a piece of your station in another country and a piece over here and a piece over there, and, and you can't. You know, you, you read the rules. Yeah, the, the rules say you can use one location. Yeah. In this particular case, they use one location and a remote station somewhere else. That's what made it not acceptable. Um, I, have to, I have to admit there are a few bad apples out there who do crazy things with their remotes that they're not supposed to do. We are not in favor of that. We want to operate legally, fairly. It's a lot more fun that way. But it's kind of a wild west out there. A lot of people do whatever they want to do, and we can't They've stop them. They've been doing that for... Yeah, yeah on the red shirt again. Amplifiers remotely. Well, if you have an auto tune, auto switching amp like an Elecraft KPA 500, Alpha 9500, Alpha 87, Acom, uh, Acom 2002, OM Power 2500, automatic what amplifiers work great. If you have a manual switched manual tune amplifier, you can actually put it on one of your bands. If your antenna switch is switching for different bands, you can put the amplifier on at least one of the bands. Um, um, and actually, I've never had any problems with the amplifiers. The, so. the, only, the only horror story I've had is that uh, one of our ACOM 2000s went into a, uh, a mode where I guess the control circuitry didn't like what it saw, so it caught it between on and off. And we could not, it was off, I mean, there was no HV, it, but we could not reset it without physically going down there, turning off the switch, and turning it back on. All right. But other than, but other than that, uh, <clears throat> I mean, we nothing got ruined. It didn't break or anything. It just got into some kind of mode. We never had it had anything again. When in doubt, restart everything. <laughs> All right. One more question. And, uh, yeah. Remote antenna switches. What, what would you recommend? So remote antenna switches. I had a slide about that. But basically, you want to set it up to be as automatic as possible. That means your radio drives a band decoder. And then the band decoder switches the, an antenna switch automatically. And filters. And if you need filters, they'd be in the line too. There are, there are probably uh, half a dozen companies that make uh, band decoders and remote antenna switches. Um, but it's kind of like setting up a fancy contest station. You know, you're, you're, you're doing something that's a little more complicated than on my radio, I can already pick antenna one or antenna two. That's a great way to start. Yeah. It's only when you got to go beyond that that you start worrying about more antenna switching. All right, thank you, everybody. Catch us in the hallways. Uh, check our slides. Come on by to discover the HF experience in the ARRL booth.